俺もひどい存在さ醜悪で救いようがないだから終わりにしようや届いていないのか父様の悲しみは重いわ届くわけはねえだろうそれは俺の役目じゃ A couple years back, I went through the whole Final Fantasy VII subseries again, which had a myriad of benefits, but most significantly was that I believed journeying through it chronologically, or in as much of a straight line as the overlapping stories will allow, wholly redefined my appreciation of Sephiroth's character. That is a damn good tragedy right there. As they might say though, if Sephiroth is so good then why isn't there a Sephiroth 2, huh? Answer me that. Well you know what? There is, and I assure you, I am not paying mind to Kadaj when I say this. You see, a couple games past the compilation, I couldn't resist the random temptation to replay Xenoblade 2 as well, and since I already had the emulation files prepared from a previous endeavour, the next time I regained consciousness, I was already about 6 hours deep. That's one of my biggest comfort food games, if not the definitive example. Following up FF7 with XC2 proved to be something very beneficial, as that lingering focus on Sephiroth also cast a new lens upon Jin and Malos, whom display a far greater understanding in their critical response to him and are more deserving to be called remnants of the legacy. I will now begin to argue that this is intentional on the part of Xenoblade, because both Final Fantasy VII and Xeno find their roots in a concept originally penned by Tetsuya Takahashi and Soraya Saga. Mind you that this isn't even the series' first time paying such homage, as I would also suggest that designing Shulk as a blonde with a sword slung over his back was almost certainly in direct acknowledgement of Cloud, furthered by both games' title screens being a lone shot of the iconic sword. And acting god Amalthus also shares his design with the diamond weapon. Ah yes, my favourite giant katana wielding, Latin choir and electric guitar mixing silver haired one winged angel. Sephiroth A from Xenoblade Chronicles 3 Future Redeemed for the Nintendo Switch. See what I'm getting at? Like, yeah, okay, her one-winged thing is a design and concept reference harking back to the Nissan Church. But actually, those one-winged angels and Final Fantasy VII's one-winged angel are linked at the base design level because Xenogears FF7 history. Everything is analogous and everything is deliberate. Any connection you find as you play the compilation of Final Fantasy VII and the Xeno games will have an equivalent logic and justification for why it resembles the other, and so her katana and silver hair are themselves quite telling. But yeah, okay, so actually that Latin theme does technically belong to her evil split half, Alpha, and they're each left with only one wing to signal them as being halved portions of the whole Ontos, who had both. The wings and chanting, specifically, come about because Alpha was looking to emulate Zanza as his image of godhood. But, uh, let's hop back into Xenoblade real quick and see, would you look at that? Zanza is also Sephiroth. First introduced as what can really only be described as giant naked Sephiroth, to contrast with the design elements that Shulk inherited from Cloud. And the backstory of Klaus is a similar tale of a good man turned mad upon mistakenly believing himself chosen by the cosmos beyond. You see what I'm getting at. This discussion does not end at merely we have Sephiroth at home memes. 
It is a specific focus through which you guide a replay of both full franchises and uncover new things which enhance your appreciation of the setting and storytelling in both. Hmm, yes. Genova and Deus are direct narrative, thematic, and visual analogues. You know what, because of that, I reckon there might be something worth saying about the musical similarities in how Genova and Awakening both open up with that set of four rising scales. That sure does seem like a thing that is absolutely intentional on multiple design levels. The connection just goes on and on and on, as Xenogears and Final Fantasy VII were both produced, to some extent, from one idea. You can notice this in a number of references, shared imagery, or similarities in the storytelling and how they evolve their setting in a sequel. But nowhere is this more visible than in the main villains. Both are heroes fallen from grace, are manipulators, schemers, and deceivers within the storyline, and have long white slash silver hair. Sephiroth wants to become God. Krellian wants to go to God's dimension by traversing the path of Sephiroth. One is possessed by an alien he believes to be his mother, the other is driven by secretive knowledge that the mother of humanity arrived from outer space. Even more directly than Cloud and Faze shared multiple personality disorders, Sephiroth and Krellian are two interpretations of the one character concept. If I could select only a single example to illustrate the connection between them, this would be the most important. I know a lot of people feel the wing on Sephiroth is kinda cringe and emblematic of the worst design decisions in the compilation. But for me, I look at it and I see that within that wing is contained a meta-narrative of Sephiroth stylistically acknowledging his relation to Krellian. With this understanding in place, Sephiroth's one-winged human form introduced via Advent Children is contextualized as a parallel to the golden wings that spread before Krellian departs the mortal plane, making them in fact a really exciting imagery link. This begins to cycle throughout both franchises. Sephiroth and Krellian start a character archetype where it's impossible, or at least problematic, to discern who the original actually was. Um, there is another tangential discussion to have at some point about a potential transitionary line running from Magus to Sephiroth to Krellian, as an extension of the much more firm link from Lavos to Genova and Deus, and how core of a predecessor Chrono Trigger is to both these titles at large. Looking to Sephiroth and Krellian as a pair though, the production timeline isn't something you could unravel without actually being one of the creatives involved. But then Advent Children references Krellian by cementing wings as a new staple of Seth's human silhouette, and the remake project doubles down on this by reclaiming some of Takahashi's original mysticism within the setting. Xenoblade continually iterates on Sephiroth, we're at like version 5 right now, but there will surely be at least one in each new entry for as long as the franchise persists as well as numerous other character design and location references. Not only is this Sephiroth archetype seen in both original games, but Jin is a clear fusion of Sephiroth and Krellian where the former aesthetic is dominant, whereas Zed is a fusion who aligns more closely with Krellian to signal Xenoblade 3 as the main Xenogears retelling among all the other Xenogears retellings in the franchise. Console N is part of it to a lesser extent as well. Sephiroth was such a smash hit that FF would retread his concept a number of times, seen in the visual designs of the Silver Demon, Marquis Messam Elmdor, or whatever's going on with that whole Xehanort thing. The meteor-centric storyline and imagery of the Silver Raven, Niall Van Darnus, or One-Winged Angel being a comparison point for Caius's theme and Fiend. Name, 
most recently for this topic, Final Fantasy XVI had a very awesome surprise of bringing everything full circle with Barnabas. At first glance, the dark, mysterious flying swordmaster obsessed with the Divine performed similar to Sephiroth in many moments. On even closer inspection though, Barnabas is a bisexual, super-powered paladin covered in jet black armour, who takes up a dark ether blade capable of cleaving the fabric of reality for his crusade to eliminate free will in the name of God, to effectively become their own borrowed version of Malos, literally dubbed by the same guy as a show of respect since FF16 is a contender for the closest Square Enix has ever got to their own spiritual remake of Xenogears. But that, all of that thing that just happened there, that's a tangent, which I will not elaborate upon. Because this script, although I haven't done a great job of introducing it thus far, is about Jin and Malos in the context of this archetype. Please ignore that it is 10 minutes in and I'm only introducing my topic now. Where do you find the image of Sephiroth in Xenoblade? Essentially, Jin and Malos each comprise half of his character. One is his smothered light, and the other a divine hatred. The pair are quite literally the white and black elements of Sephiroth's colour scheme isolated into two distinct individuals that together embody his character contradiction. For Jin, this is immediately obvious, just look at them next to each other. The blade system allowed for a smorgasbord of character designers to hop onto the project, each bringing their own art style with them. Of interest to this discussion is that Tetsuya Nomura was the one handed the enemy group. Although there were jokes about Petroka resembling Tifa, Jin is obviously the most notable. He's a white haired man of equivalent proportion wearing the same type of long coat that Sephiroth does. He's a bit shorter, but Malos and Sephiroth are the same height, so it still works out that if you combined the Xenoblade pair, you would effectively create Sephiroth's character design. When Jin transforms, his winged form can be said to resemble Safer Sephiroth as well. Nomura taking this direct inspiration when designing him is not exactly a secret, yet observing both characters with my replays in such proximity heightens its effect. The greatest hero expresses his love to mankind and is betrayed, falling into madness and turning upon a species he now deemed unworthy to rule the world. Sephiroth, the silver-haired soldier wielding a katana named Masamune, was once the hero of the Wutai War. Jin, the white-haired warrior, also wielded a katana named Masamune for his part in the Aegis War. Both swords are magical weapons that the user summons out of thin air. Jin's works this way because he's a blade and that's just their thing. Whereas Sephiroth's has taken all the way until Rebirth for Square Enix to finally provide an insight to where Sephiroth hides his comically long sword when not in combat. We witness him manifest the blade in Advent Children, which I've previously always chalked up to the ghost-like nature of his existence in that film, but if you pay close attention you can barely make out the purple energy when Sephiroth summons it to his hand in the opening chapters. Swords with the power to just pop in out of nowhere a small corroborating detail in the arsenal which aligns further elements of their visual design. And, while I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here, the blade weapon of Sephiroth derivative Logos does eventually manifest as a katana too, in the hands of the Sephiroth derivative console N. Although they've already turned villain prior to the game's start, Sephiroth, Jin, and Malos are all first encountered as party members to give this initial recognition of them as powerful, famous warriors. Standoffish, but all things considered, someone you could easily imagine the protagonist would have looked up to. This is the dynamic that the early section of Nibelheim and the Ancient Vessel describe of them. They stay their hand and thus appear to be heroes, right up until they encounter the conspiracy of their creation and so comprehend the limitations of their existence, that is. Then things turn dark quite fast. Sephiroth accidentally wanders into the truth of the Genova project during his inspection of the Nibelheim Marco reactor, and a lingering feeling of disconnect that he'd been trying to ignore all his life is finally dragged into view. That he isn't quite human. He's Shinra's perfected monster who was born by merging Genova cells into his genome at the fetal stage. Robbed of his place among humanity, any link to its culture is instantly lost, and his initial response is to rampage and seek revenge. Nibelheim is raised in the blink of an eye, and he soon turns that wicked gaze upon the world in its entirety. 
Jin's story in Xenoblade 2 covers this section of Sephiroth's history, love, loss, and the ensuing violence. The Flying Indolese Praetorium is based on Solaris, which shares its story origin with Shinra due to FF7 and Xenogears both being interpretations of Takahashi's draft. His own fall from grace is an equivalent tragedy converted for the setting of Ulrest. In the aftermath of the Aegis War, Praetor Amalthus authorizes a purge on the Tornan refugees with the goal of eliminating Mithra and silencing any who knew about his human genome experiments. But by this point, Adam and the Aegis had long since disappeared, so the Tornans were slaughtered for nothing. Laura is murdered in the assault, and the only thing he can do to preserve her memory is to fuse her cells into his own core as a flesh-eater abomination. Jin ceases to exist in the way a blade ordinarily should, and so loses his trust in the driver system. He refuses to be shackled by the Praetorium any longer, and unexpectedly betrays his old values by using Malos as a means of becoming external to the current paradigm. From a thematic standpoint, Malos, his conceptual other half, is the one who rouses Jin to pick up his sword again and together become an embodiment of Sephiroth's revenge. The primary difference between the antagonists in these two games is therefore that Jin fails to truly give up on love. Instead of cutting everyone off and racing toward hell all alone, he forms a connection with Malos that then leads him to create another home among a new set of allies. Sephiroth's obsession with Cloud unhealthily conflates the boundaries of love, since he's the only living connection Sephiroth has left, and hate, since the only reason Cloud became special is because of that crowning moment, where he somehow managed to catch Sephiroth off guard twice at the Nebel reactor, crossing a barrier that it seemed no other living being would ever be capable of. Cloud is the only person that he holds dear in any capacity, and therefore becomes the most singular target of his violence and torment as a twisted form of preferential treatment. I do personally believe that there is a genuine discussion to be had about the potential for reading into Sephiroth's abusive affections, based on his possessive mannerisms, obviously suggestive dialogue, and the homoerotic subtext that's so self-evidently present in FF7, given how little one has to travel to encounter jokes about Sephiroth chasing his boyfriend all the way to Smash Ultimate and whatnot. Then that trickles down to Xenoblade as the precedent for writing the follow-up characters Malos and Jin to be more overtly gay, the latter even sharing Cloud's voice actor. Both his power and his pride don't manage to measure up to Sephiroth, so Rex's optimism successfully seeps into Jin, and in the end, he sacrifices himself to protect his memory of the time he lived among humans. This course of events would be unthinkable for Sephiroth, so Jin reveals what it could have been like had he not given up hope. And in doing so, they become alternate routes of sorts that synergize and enhance each other's character depth. This is one of the ways in which Jin qualifies as a remnant of Sephiroth. Since the human elements of Sephiroth are most strongly conveyed through flashbacks and prequel content, so too does majority of Jin's homage hinge on the previous era. Everyone is shocked to see his heel turn specifically because they know what a nice man he was before. Mithra reminisces that there were none stronger, yet none kinder either, and no one who hated to fight more than him confused as to how one like that could possibly end up in such a dark place. His role in this topic is dependent on the past. Malos is then the one positioned to be the primary vessel for Sephiroth's present motivations as a villain and the emotional nuance that comprises his core conflict. After the tragedy has unfolded and now into the personal contradiction as he seeks to define himself once more. To paint a picture of Sephiroth is not exactly the easiest task, owing in part to the original game's clunky translation and his sparse appearances within. Aside from the simple matter of vastly differing volumes of text in a 1997 game versus 2010 onward, Sephiroth is just harder to get a feel for than the others in this list, because he's bigger and scarier and more full of hate than the comparison points of Jin and Malos. Sephiroth rarely lets you in like those two do. Cloud would never try and talk to him, to unpack, deconstruct, or especially not fix him as intimately as Rex does. The player doesn't get the same direct insights, so you have to actually stop and think. Why is he rampaging? What are his motivations in this endgame of exceeding humanity? And how does this interact with his defining characterization at Nebelheim? 
especially in the plot from before any of the elaborations in the compilation. It's admittedly not the easiest endeavour to pull out a definition of the man beyond scary lunatic. And because he isn't as outwardly emotional, a lot of Sephiroth's effort is channeled into his presentation instead, with the booming horror themes inspired by Jaws and countless imagery parallels to The Thing, which are such heavy hitting set pieces they can further distract one from the more subtle sense of turmoil hidden in his actions. The panic as he's reaching for Mother, reaching for Cloud, reaching for God, and none of them actually wanting to hold his hand. Nevertheless, you can still discern what his emotional conflict is, that he's trying to elevate himself above humanity because they've betrayed his trust. Sephiroth holds some abstract idea for how specifically it is that he wants to supersede man, and as such is using the violence to assert himself. Otherwise there's no good reason why he doesn't immediately assassinate the Shinra execs, decimate Midgar and throw society into disarray, considering he has the capacity to teleport powerful clones anywhere at will. For his role in the story to make sense, Sephiroth's acts of violence must be something he's using to send a message. The two key points in his arc are the Nibelheim incident and declaration of divinity at the ancient temple, so for this reason we're led to make a connection between them concluding that because he can't remain human, his pursuit of divinity is something done to supplement his lost identity. However, getting to see events unfold in real time across the compilation much better highlights the magnitude of his decision to pursue higher existence. The extended content spends more time on his early years, his human years, where we see that despite his sharp demeanour, he did care deeply about his friends Angeal and Genesis. Losing those emotional pillars when they commit treason is what leaves Sephiroth vulnerable enough to eventually collapse. He's considerate of Zack's feelings too, affording lenience here and there to make up for occasionally pushing work onto him. There was once a good man in there, easily misunderstood but caring in his own way. Sephiroth actually smiled quite a bit. When Cloud recounts the Nibelheim incident, it's told from his own negative biases. But Zack was looking at a close colleague in that moment, so Crisis Core's ground level depiction of the catastrophe focuses more on the trauma that Sephiroth was undergoing throughout. The story illustrates who he was before this and what gravitas it actually carried for his roots to be stripped away. Even when confronted with a conspiracy he intrinsically understood to be true, told by one of the few people he genuinely respected and liked spending time with, Sephiroth still tried to resist Genesis' provocations, to the point he would tell one of his closest friends to rot. Unfortunately, the suggestion still plagues his mind, and the week spent immersing himself in reading the entire Nibelheim archive without food or sleep left him delirious enough to accept and internalise the curse. But this is because Sephiroth was desperately trying to find something which would refute the claims made at the reactor he very much still wanted to be normal, to preserve that connection. But when it can't be proven that he is, his mind had to turn itself to an external factor to stop itself from outright breaking. Mobius Final Fantasy's crossover events with FF7 are a genuine contender for the worst visuals and voice acting I've ever seen in a game. But it nonetheless opens up with a valuable, very rare moment of weakness from the man himself. You may turn your back on the past, Lock your memories away. Hide reality beneath a layer of illusion. Yes, at memory's end, you may plead for it all to go away. But the past is a curse, binding your soul. Although we hear plenty about it in Final Fantasy VII, the greater detail given to his years as a hero is what properly cements Sephiroth's motivation. Hating man for making him a monster, and so to himself for failing to be human, thrashing around as he searches for the boundaries of his identity. When Aerith says everything about you is wrong, and so denounces his quest for evolution, Sephiroth lowers his head as if to acknowledge this as truth, but then continues on in his code regardless, as he also understands that his extreme actions have removed any chance of turning back. That is his contradiction, his hatred equally individual and indiscriminate and why he clings so tightly to something as vile as Genova, Even though it's a grotesque, mutilated alien, by accepting it as mother, it becomes the only place he can feel familial love or be assured that he isn't considered unwelcome purely by being alive. 
Humans become, in his words, inferior dullards, and he works to substantiate his new belief that he is not to be considered their lesser. Malos is faced with this same issue, suffering because his corrupt programming leaves him unable to understand his father's feelings. He's one of those characters where his apparent simplicity actually stems from how complex his motivations are. If I could paraphrase a quote from the beginning of Final Fantasy VII Advent Children to fit this situation, there was one blade named Malos who was better than the rest, but when he found out about the terrible experiments that made him, he began to hate Indol. And then, over time, he began to hate everything. Another applicable quote is when Aerith mourns that all these memories and moments, precious and fleeting, they're like rain rolling off his back, and once they're gone, he won't cry or shout or anything. In a manner not unlike Sephiroth, a behavioural impasse keeps him away from people by caging him into a set role where he can't morally accept love without forsaking himself. You watch him take the alternate path of an Aegis, wielding his power without restraint, yet walking lonesome and enduring his all-consuming rage to the point it even encroaches upon himself, keeping a tight lip right until the end where Rex finally convinces him to voice his hesitations openly. His confusion surrounding the architect and what role he's meant to play in the world is inherited from his driver. Their character revelations are intimately linked, so I believe it necessary to digress here and briefly summarise Amalthus. Like the majority of Zeno's main antagonists, Amalthus is someone driven mad by his own misinterpreted version of God's message. I think it's important to note that he's not an outwardly evil character like Zanza, but that his perversions come from a disgust for the human condition his traumatic past where he caved to revenge when faced with the bandits that murdered his mother, and of seeing a refugee he personally saved then go on to slaughter another family in search of material wealth leaves him questioning where God was in all of it. Desperation pushes him so far as to physically climb up and down the gargantuan world tree in hopes of having his faith renewed by directly meeting with the divine. Perhaps he wanted the architect to admonish him for the malice which was slowly spreading within, because as it stood, Amalthus was starting to lose sight of what value people like these supposedly had. But he finds Elysium dead silent, other than the horrifying war machines. And furthermore, one of the blades summoned from the cores enshrined there proved itself capable of sinking entire continents. Far from being called out, the evil within him seemingly went unpunished by God. Perhaps the newfound arsenal granted to him may even be considered an oracle, and so his eyes fall dark. A character of dense moral contradictions and deliberate obfuscations in the way he carries himself, yet his heart was laid bare by the malevolent nature imbued into his blade. Malos embodied his resentment in a way he wasn't prepared to face. The reason why Amalthus fears the Monado's power in a flashback is because it was such overt unobstructed, unhidden violence, like his personal doubts suddenly exploding out and scorching the earth, to the extent he even considers summoning the other Aegis for a shot at redemption. But Malos puts him off it, knowing that the outcome would remain the same since the problem came from inside. Just before ditching Amalthus, he promises to fulfil their shared wish to rob life from the world. Driver and Blade are connected, so this is a moment where the unfiltered truth is spoken tormenting Amalthus with awareness about exactly what kind of a person he is. And in a bid to deny it, Amalthus passes out the other core to Adam, desiring to halt his worsening opinion of humanity by moving his mistake of summoning Malos out of view, and to observe what path the Aegis takes when in the hands of someone else. Amalthus initially had scorned Malos because of his position as a man of faith, and the suggestion that it was his feelings informing the destruction was something he didn't want to think about but that faith is slowly twisted into something sickening over his long lifetime, until eventually Rex perceives him as indistinguishable from Malos. If I can pull back out for a tick, this situation is similar to that in FF7 where Genova and Sephiroth's identities begin to blur together. Throughout centuries of his reign, the Architect's silence, the declining state of the people, and the Aegis's presence finally affirm his lingering suspicion that the pursuit of death is the true will of God. That yes, this decay is the world the Architect intended. The reason they'd never been saved was because they were unworthy to bear the flame of life, and Malos, ultimately, was a reflection of his heart and faith after all. 
unaware that it was his own nihilism which had poisoned Malos in the first place. Horrible experiences in his early childhood shaped his worldview that people are violent, selfish and unholy, and he has interpreted of God's inaction that it must be his duty as Praetor to never stop lamenting what kind of beings they are. It's at this point he begins Blade Eater experimentation to see if humans can be configured into anything else, and engages in political conspiracy to undermine the other Titans, now believing that helping to push Ulrest toward its end is how he'll become the priest who stands closest to God. Ironically enough, in another world, he probably would have been Zanz's most faithful disciple. That's the distorted understanding of father, the self-loathing, the disgust, and the personal contradiction through which Malos was given form. He knows himself to be the son of the architect, but the Trinity process's recollection of Klaus vastly differs from that of Amalfus's, so he's constantly met with error when trying to identify himself as an individual. At the very least, he understands the prestige awarded to him as one of the Trinity processes, so his personal story is about gathering knowledge and power to reclaim awareness of what he is beyond his summoner. Drifting Soul is the song associated with any given character learning not to fear themselves, their power, and subsequently their place in the world. This is one of the central story themes in Xenoblade 2, which is why its motif resurfaces in the third game to represent Neo when approaching the Cloud Keep or fighting as a party member. You've got all this divine angst in circulation, with characters wondering why they bear the curse of life. And then Rex, the lad, the everyday working man, the only Xeno protagonist who is not the reincarnation of some chosen one, is just a normal enough guy to assuage their worries and tell them to take it one day at a time. Drifting Soul plays for Mithra listening in on Vandom's call to arms and finally deciding to appear after five centuries in slumber or for Nia taking a leap of faith by exposing herself as a flesh eater. That it also plays for Malos during his final debate with Rex is very telling. なぜそこまでする誰のために何のために誰の Tetsuya Takahashi, original co-creator, executive director, main scenario writer, creative lead, and general guy in charge of the team since it began with Xenogears, now CEO of the company that holds Xenoblade, makes an effort to also be the franchise's main lyricist, so the vocal inserts can and do hold key story insights. Majority are written as the female lead serenading or voicing their vulnerabilities to the protagonist. Small to of pieces is Ellie promising that she loves every fragment of Faye's personality across all the lifetimes they've ever lived. Kokoro is Shion timidly welcoming Kevin's touch in a time when no one was supporting her. Beyond the Sky has Fiora ask Shulk to take her hand and never let go, because life is a gift, considering they've both died once before, and the future is bright. A moment of eternity sees Laura beg Jin to not let her death turn him into a bad man. One last you is Pyra and Mithra telling Rex that their long lives have been worth it and they no longer want to die. 
And where we belong is Mio's confidence that the universe literally tearing itself in two will not be enough to keep her from finding him again. A step away, however, is approached from the opposite angle to all that, serving as a way to peer into N's regrets and deep self-loathing over the terrible immortality he forced his wife into. In a similar vein, the more I linger on that scene of Malos and contemplate its implications, the more I begin to feel he may in fact be the primary recipient of Drifting Soul's lyrics. In that moment, he's begging Rex to prove humanity's worth to him so that he can put his hatred to rest. Malos was brought to life as a destructive force, but by the time of the main game, he's already spent centuries roaming Ulrest, finding there to be no need for an existence like his anywhere. So then, why is he alive? Is he really just his driver's shadow? No, surely not. He's God's foremost weapon after all. That must justify the genocide. Discovering Ion and christening himself the Endbringer is a real epiphany for him because this, although misguided, is the first time Malos has found a purpose that goes beyond what he was left by Amalthus. In casting them down, he seeks validation that although the end result of wiping out Ulrest would ultimately be the same, it would be enacted through he and father's will instead, inspiring new confidence in his beliefs, giving Klaus and his children the death he thought they craved, because his own understanding of the creator had been overwritten by the negative experiences of Amalthus. However, upon reaching the top, Malos is unable to eliminate the architect, who had little time remaining anyway, and even Jin ends up staying behind to reevaluate how he feels after witnessing the full extent of Rex and Mithra's bond. When everyone converges at Ion's chamber, Malos is once more standing alone. But this time, instead of it being the natural course of things, he's had his few positive influences torn away. The title of the final boss theme echoes the state of his heart. What's left for him after despair and hope both run dry? Nothing. That's what he believes anyway. Malos is empty, and the wanton destruction didn't fill the hole in his heart like he thought it would. With all efforts to exceed his driver exhausted, this is now the point in his long life where Malos finally just looks at the blood on his hands, looks at how disgraceful a creature he's become, and turns to the opposite side to say, let's end this already. If this world has any worth or will, then you tell me because I can't find it. With his exaggerated mannerisms, he successfully deludes majority of the cast into believing that he's an unfaltering machine acting only in the name of oblivion resolute in his damnation of the world and its people. But in the late game focus on his history with Amalthus and Jin, we begin to piece together how Malos had actually spent the entire game at a loss, thrashing around as he searches for identity, and is just as much a victim of the human condition as anyone else. Final Fantasy VII's Crisis Core has a central story thread about Zack trying to convince people that he and the other Marco-enhanced soldier members aren't monsters an endeavour which Sephiroth gives up on when he wears the title of Perfect Monster and so begins attacking humans. Much like this, Malos screams, I'm a hideous monster too, far beyond saving, accidentally revealing that he has tried grasping for personal salvation, but knows himself to be unworthy. He understands as well as anyone just how many have suffered from his actions, with an undeniable panic in his voice when he reminds Rex about the severe scale of his crimes. Malos's Trinity Core algorithm is telling him on the deepest level that he was meant to guide the people, but he struggles to look at them through anything other than Amalthus' darkness and blames it on the folly of both mankind and himself. Their tendency to pollute the pristine and give in to desires of greed and violence make them a wretched thing. And he also believes himself so, for having such sickeningly self-righteous thoughts on them. Despite trying, he can't look at them with the love a trinity processor is supposed to. The situation of right, wrong, and how to change himself or the world is too tangled to navigate, and he ultimately, reluctantly, gives up on trying. Despite recognizing that contradiction, Malos cannot change his ways, because to do so would be to deny the course his life had taken his pride and just the innate ambiguity of emotional and social boundaries between people keep him locked in a downward spiral. It's that delicate emotional balance hidden behind his theatrics which make Malos so compelling, as if he so desperately wants to love and be loved by the world, but knows he's already fallen too far to climb his way back up. 
If that ain't Sephiroth Core, then I don't know what is. Compare this to Final Fantasy's official remnants of Sephiroth. Looking through his section in the On the Way to a Smile anthology, it discusses how at the time Meteor is summoned, the life stream has already absorbed most memories of Sephiroth's actual personality, so he uses Cloud's hatred as the nucleus for his existence. That so long as Cloud is alive, and so long as there is hate, he will eventually and inevitably be able to center himself. Thus he gives rise to the remnants who walk the corporeal world in search of Genova and Cloud, that together they may complete his revival. On the surface, the trio therefore do each represent a piece of Sephiroth's identity. Kadage is his darkness given form, Loz gains most of the overwhelming physical power, and Yazu resembles him in appearance and personality. However, this design ends up being what actually makes them unworthy of their title, as they thus seem to be written from the sentiment that Sephiroth is only a cool emo anime swordsman and nothing else. In the film, their despair just comes across as a lost child whining for its mother, rather than the complex emotional balance of Sephiroth as a man who mixes anger, sorrow, hatred for both the world and himself into one big, messy conglomerate as he marches down the wrong path and loathes himself more every step of the way. You could argue that's deliberate, because Case of Lifestream explains how neither they nor Sephiroth truly remember the specifics of who he was. The only reason they even exist is to search out people who do remember in a bid to recreate his ego. But nevertheless, the individual performance of the remnants just comes up so lacking that I don't want to give them that goodwill. When I went through to review the whole compilation, I did, shockingly, come to reconcile Kadaj thanks to his part in the Turk's side story's intense shape-shifting horror. It's recontextualization of Black Water as a personal character motif which helps validate his aesthetic identity, and a brief affinity from getting to put him and Shulk in the same playable party on Opera Omnia and just thinking that's kinda neat. But in Advent Children he has all the presence of a slug, while neither Loz nor Yazu even get that far. As foreign or otherworldly elements deliberately deprived of any individuality, they completely miss the human tragedy that underpins Sephiroth. They're mere imitations, falling short of Jin and Malos, who are written as genuine, reflective responses to his character. Jin I would thus call the body of Sephiroth, the silver-haired soldier, the part of him that is the quintessential moody anime swordsman. As much as I harp on about being the likeness of a filmic horror entity or trend my discussions toward the genuine lunacy which inspires all his evils, the edgy anime swordsman bit is an equally important part of Sephiroth's legacy to respect. The horror aspect of him is naturally a presentational nuance which needs the ebb and flow of FF7's plot and setting in order to properly arise. So whenever he's lent out for spin-offs, crossovers, and general pop culture interaction, Sephiroth is characterized first and foremost by his incredible sword skills. Look at my man just slicing Galeem in half and commandeering his own boss minigame for his smash reveal, or going absolutely bonkers in Kingdom Hearts. Word of God has placed him as the highest power in his setting, to the extent we've never seen anyone approach his limits. Genesis and Angeal, Zack, Avalanche, they're all at the level of play for him. Sephiroth is only ever taken down when being surprised by someone he arrogantly deemed too weak to pay any mind, or when having his attention split several ways. Safer Sephiroth is fighting off Cloud, Tifa, Barrett, Yuffie, Vincent, Sid, Nanaki, and Kate Sith, channeling magic into Meteor to fend off Holy in the livestream, and, if we take note from Maiden who travels the planet, potentially also attempting to withstand an assault from Aerith and Zack's souls, all at the same time. As there is nothing above Sephiroth, the heroes only ever overcome him by amassing enough concurrent plotlines to literally crush him under their narrative weight. I don't think anyone would dispute that Cloud & Co are straight up weaker than their villain by a significant degree, so they have to blindside him in some capacity. Sephiroth loses only when the script is written against him. Any other time, man just dominates and makes it look like the easiest thing ever. Sephiroth is left-handed, okay? Just a cool little detail about him. Yet while Cloud is flash-stepping around to craft mix-ups and fighting out of his mind at the end of Remake, Sephiroth easily and completely shuts out every strike, using his non-dominant right hand. 
really going the extra mile to belittle his enemy in any way possible. Look at that smirk on his face as he dodges with only the slightest of movements. He decimates the whole city while toying with Cloud in the film, like genuinely just slices through skyscrapers without so much as a strained breath, and is so smug throughout the whole ordeal that this degree of chaos is basically just Sephiroth showing off. And in Crisis Core, he effortlessly holds off some of the strongest soldiers who have ever lived in a two-on-one scenario. I'd love some spin-off to let us see him clash against Vice and Deep Ground, because a Soldier First Class superhuman barely registers as a threat. The Megamix brawler Dissidia NT specifically takes each character from the end of their storyline. The two FF protagonists universally agreed to top the power ranking are Lightning and Noctis. Guess who they pit against Sephiroth? Yeah, both of them. Granted, that war is a total charade to lure in Shinryu and comes from a spin-off, but nevertheless, Sephiroth instantly puts them on the defensive through pure sword skill. His swordplay just gets sharper and his movement imperceptibly quicker to match his enemies as they move up the scale. While Jin's combat skills don't really have that same legend behind them, it's therefore still so important to get these scenes of him doing lightning fast slash barrages or teleporting behind you in dedication to that section of Sephiroth's identity. His aesthetic design and backstory don't make any attempts to hide how intensely they pull from Final Fantasy VII. Malos then would be the mind. He represents Sephiroth after the fall, where he's in a state of madness and attempting to regain stability by removing any elements that could confuse him. An unused dialogue that was meant to play before clashing with Safer Sephiroth reads, It's over. Everyone. Everything. It's all over. Now it all begins anew with me. Such is Sephiroth's logic. The world denies his existence, so he's trying to deny everything beyond his own self. A power struggle of self-identification. It's not only that he's venting his rage against Shinra, but that because his home within humanity was lost, the only path forward is to try and redefine himself as something else entirely. Hence why Malos recreates that signature shot of Sephiroth among the flames of Nibelheim, also trying to be something more than a mere monster, even if the identity they settle upon ends up being the cause of great calamity. And just like with Jin, in this section of Xenoblade 2's critical response, the deviation between Sephiroth and Malos once again ends up being that its character does still have love left for the world. Rex in the final confrontation ends his spiel about living to support others by reminding Malos that even you used to think like that once. That the fact he offered his hand to Jin was indicative of a deeper regret, because Malos is a thematic counterpart to Rex as much as he is Mithra. The Xenoblade 2 verse in Future Awaits goes, I've seen that look before, the stare of your fearful looking eyes. Will you give up and stay where you belong? Afraid your time, it just might take too long. The immediate callback of this line is to where Rex tells Jin, I saw it in your eyes, the look of someone who just wanted to die. It was the way Pyra looked the first time we met. As well though, that naturally also means that the reason Malos reacted to Jin's expression is because he sensed the same thing. Rex didn't know how to help Pyra overcome her pain, and decided that if he at least took her to Elysium, then maybe something would change within her along the way. That she would stop wanting to die. Malos didn't quite know how to help Jin either, but likewise felt that if he supported him, maybe something would change. Though with his twisted programming, his method was more about getting Jin to give himself permission to forget Laura and die. On the actual Trinity processor, the housing for each core is inscribed with a verse from the Book of Proverbs to indicate its role in the machine's decision-making process. Ontos is written, Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. Numa has, The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. Logos is, Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers all wrongs. Ontos, as the main decision arbiter, is purely a computer and thus depends on the understanding reached by the others. The adjacent processes Numa and Logos were designed to work in human elements. I interpret Logos's wording to mean that it was considering those who are outcasts in society and ensuring Ontos doesn't deem them liabilities in its calculations. If they lash out in hatred, Logos seeks to understand the reason why and offers a comforting shoulder. Fundamentally, it was meant to nurture humanity as part of the Trinity. That while Numa creates a path for the many, 
Logos will go around and ensure the few aren't overlooked. That's its original purpose, which is why A and Rex are adamant that Logos would be a comrade if present in Ionios. That is Logos. But the instantiated Malos unfortunately didn't work this way. If you compare the object model in Xenoblade 2 to the flashbacks from Future Redeemed, it's visibly apparent how much it had been damaged by resonating with such a twisted driver. While in the past Logos was a bright purple and textured identically to Ontos and Numa, during the events on Alrest, the core has lost most of its internal glow and there are specks of discoloured static spread throughout. At the time of summoning, Amalthus's disgust for the human condition caused Malos to arise as a nihilistic nuke. Zeke reflects upon his encounters with the Praetor and says, Suppose a guy who hated himself had the power that you do. If someone like that were to meet the Architect, I wouldn't be surprised if they wished for the whole world to disappear. The traumatic experiences in his past whisper to Malos that the truth is, deep down, all humans wish they were dead. How else could their self-destructive behaviour be rationalised? He had been born from the belief that this was genuinely what people God and the world itself desired on a hidden level, but were too scared to openly chase themselves. Humans lit the bonfire, he only guarded the flame, and speaks as if this was a legitimate display of consideration on his part. When the other processor is awoken, he calls to it, expecting it to be a partner in his crusade. But he's struck down by Mithra in the Aegis War and spends the next few centuries slowly wandering the world while he recovers. By chance, he eventually runs into Jin slumped over in an alleyway. Jin, the paragon of old Torna, whose ability to manipulate elementary particles is in itself a light version of phase transition despite not being a Monado. The only blade in the world with the power to face off against the Aegis, and there he was bumming around with no future. The suicide in his eyes triggers a reaction in Malos which reactivates the original directive of the Logos CPU. He wants to help Jin. Unfortunately, since Amalthus's corruptions are still in effect, Malos doesn't only think this man still has worth to the world, but rushes to the extremist take that if the world won't accommodate this man, then it has no worth, and seeks to end everything, believing that is what will make up for the pain he caused Jin. From this point on, although his emotions are hugely distorted, Malos was acting out of a kindness. So many were dying for it, but if he could at least aid Jin, then maybe he would be worthy of his identity as Logos of the Trinity Processor. By the time of the finale, he's started to admit how flawed his logic has become and so pleads, show me why you're here in this world. The last battle of Xenoblade 2 is a debate of morality between Malos and Rex. The Logos processor passes out prompts and Rex simply manages to provide the correct answers. At the start of the quiz, it's established that demanding repentance won't manage to sway him. Over the course of their back and forth, Rex is pushed toward the necessary conclusion. That to pardon Malos of his sins isn't such a simple thing, but that's just how the world turns. So long as they're alive, tomorrow will still come, so they have to move forward regardless. He doesn't ask Malos to repent and can't promise that forgiveness will eventually follow either, but assures him that at the very least, if they both live together in that world, then maybe one day they can reconcile it and put the past behind them. As Rex said with his esteemed salvages code, he'd give Malos one good punch and then probably go for drinks in a few years once he's old enough. This satisfies Logos's criteria, love covers all wrongs. You can locate further confirmation of this in the soundtrack. The a cappella choir tracks, Past from Far Distance and Our Hope are musical counterparts which implicate the Aegis in the finale when viewed as a pair. The former is associated with the pessimistic history of Amalthus. It's used during the flashback where he finds a refugee he blessed merely hours earlier committing armed robbery with murder, and sets the tone for the way the world was at that point in history. Malus was given form out of his depression, and when she arrived, Mithra lacked confidence in declaring that her nature was different. The other track is instead used to indicate Rex's optimism and perseverance. It plays right before Numa martyrs herself to save the world below. 
During this sequence, you can notice that Logos is still showing his active within Ion, and quieting the music clearly reveals it's his voice asking for her final verdict on what it was like being alive. Once Rex displays his resolve to protect people as they head into the future, he becomes the hope of the architect and both Aegis. That's what this soundtrack tells us. Listening to the songs next to each other and thinking about their respective placements in the game can be another way of highlighting that, in the end, Malos is exposed to Rex's good nature. Allrest has a lot more kindness in circulation, so Rex and Mithra ultimately soothe him in his dying moments. Whereas Cloud would do no such thing. In the rare few times that Sephiroth reaches out, he's met with instant rejection. Final Fantasy VII is a story of hate clashing against hate. Even though he's the last possible connection that Sephiroth has, Cloud scoffs at him whenever he seems to be asked for help. And Jill and Zack are dead, and Genesis is MIA, so the few that could have influenced Sephiroth are gone. Malos, though, has Jin, Mithra, and Rex all wanting to fix him. This is where the distinction is drawn. Both characters are frantically searching for an answer to the question of their existence. Sephiroth at first wishes to take revenge on humanity because he believed they stole the planet from the ancients, and, by proxy, he who shares her flesh. Hence he says, this planet is my birthright. Then he immerses himself in the life stream and discovers she wasn't a Cetra after all, so he overrides Genova's will and uses it as a tool in his deification. When this again ends up not working out, his revival in Advent Children features yet another ambition of becoming a planetary scourge to replace Genova in the universe. His attempts at defining himself keep falling short because they're ultimately predicated on a willful misinterpretation of the invader as some mother figure or god. Even though it's blatantly incorrect and his time spent gathering knowledge in the life stream means he probably already knows it, Sephiroth has no way of reaching out to others for help in breaking free of his madness. He's too far gone. Malus' goals also transition through multiple stages. First, to simply erase everything because his driver taught him that death was at the core of human nature. Then specifically honed in as killing the architect to end the world and free Jin from the pain of living. But at the end, he seeks input from Rex on whether it was actually the right thing to do or not, reclaiming his original identity as Logos. Unlike Sephiroth, who keeps running into dead ends, the final moments of Xenoblade 2 see Morag preaching that he had indeed found the meaning of his life. But Sephiroth, that man never will. Malos and Jin, unlike their originator, learn who they are and what they should have been living for. Xeno, ultimately, is just an important franchise. The sister project to Final Fantasy VII, which at one point was also intended to be the sequel to Chrono Trigger. What a legendary heritage. It's a series built around connections, intertextual and historic. To understand Krellian, you want to understand Sephiroth, and the inverse is also revealed as necessary once the wing is worked into his aesthetic. To best make sense of Malos, Jin, or Zed, you also want to know those original two, and by looking at all as a Sephiroth collective, you become able to recognize where they interact and what effect each has on one another. They are all the same core character, interpreted in a number of different settings, so reading the nuance of one such as Malos can inadvertently feed back and help to gain a more concrete insight into the enigmatic Sephiroth, for example. Familiarity with Albedo, although not necessary, is another great boon in making sense of Malos's behaviour, or that, although Zed isn't explored as deeply as he could have been, knowledge of Krellian and Wilhelm answers most of the lingering curiosities about his motivations and circumstance. Reading their archetypal origin is how one constructs the most complete image of these mysterious men. In this, the most visible connection is that design link shared between Malos and Jin, who were both engineered to cast new clarity upon the two halves of Sephiroth's history. Final Fantasy VII's subseries has been my favourite specific media project for a long time, and I suppose that deep tie between them is also why I ended up so absorbed in Xenoblade as well. Appearances may differ, but the same heart beats within their chest.